فندعوه بها وذروا الذين يلحدون في أسمائه سيجزون ما كانوا يعملون بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Um, as this is the final lesson, um, I'm going to choose certain names. We're not going to stick to the order of the book today. So I've just selected a few names that we will go through, inshallah. The, the first thing that we will go through today is uh, al latif which is on page 17. <coughs> so, page 17, al latif the most subtle, the, the kind. The one whose knowledge encompasses all the secret and hidden matters, who is aware of all that is hidden, in the deepest depths of the heavens and the earth, and is aware of everything down to the most minute and finest details. The one who is kind to his believing servants, guiding them to that which would benefit them and aid them by means that they are not aware. This by his kindness and beneficence. It also carries the meaning of al-khabir, so the one who is uh, well informed, you can say, of a the one who has the intricate details of, of, of knowledge, and al Ma'uf, the, the most compassionate. And then he quotes uh, some verses, no vision can grasp him, but his grasp is, um, but his grasp is over all vision. He is the most subtle, and latif, and the well acquainted, al khabir Do you not see that Allah sends down the water from the sky and the earth and becomes uh, and, 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 and then the earth becomes green. Indeed, Allah is the kind and the well acquainted. So, Al Latif and Khabir, as we can see, they are two names that are usually mentioned alongside uh, each other. Now, Al Latif, <coughs> the name itself has been mentioned seven times in the Quran, and linguistically, uh, is from the word Latufa, 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 which con conveys two meanings. One is that of gentleness. So, Arifq, we say in Arabic, Arifq, R I F Q. So, you have Arafiq, the, the one who is gentle. But linguistically, Latufa can also mean something which is very minute and very sensitive. So, in the Arabic language, um, the, the, the phrase Latif, it can, it can refer to both being gentle, but also um, refer to something which is small and is aware of the finer details of something. Now, obviously, when it comes to the dad, the essence of Allah, we do not describe Allah as being small or minute. But in terms of his knowledge, he is aware of the most finest details. And that's why Shaykh Sa'di, when he explained this name, he said it also conveys the meaning of Khabir, the well acquainted. And we've looked at the name Al Khabir before, and we said it was very similar to what other name of Allah. Al Khabir, you remember? Al Basir. Al Basir, to a certain degree, another name. Al Alim, the All Knowing. And the difference between Al Alim and Al Khabir was what? That Al Khabir focuses on what um, the, the expertise of somebody's knowledge, when somebody knows the, 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 finest, the finer details of a particular matter. That's why even the Arabic language, Khabir, we use amongst human beings to refer to who? Specialist. A specialist or an expert. expert. Yeah. A specialist, an expert, because they have finer detail, knowledge, finer detail knowledge of that particular matter. 
And there is a deep connection between al-khibra, having fine knowledge of something, and that of gentleness. Okay? This, this is a deep connection. Now, to understand this, I mean, those, especially those who are mothers, um, they know their children very well. And they know what makes them upset, and they know what makes them happy. And, you know, they can see, as soon as something is wrong with their child, they can see it straight away. Other people, they'll look at that child and they think that child just, just looks normal. But what do they have? They have a finer knowledge of the situation of the child, which enables them to be one, to be more gentle and to be more caring. To be more gentle and more caring. So, a stipulation to be gentle and to be very caring, one must be well acquainted. One must have finer knowledge of something. One needs to be sensitive to another person's circumstances and feelings. Without that sensitivity, then being caring towards that person is going to be very difficult. And that's why being sensitive is conditional for being caring. You can't have a caring person who is not sensitive. It, it, it just doesn't happen. Because what will happen if you lack sensitivity you are bound to hurt somebody's feelings. If you lack that sensitivity, you are bound to hurt somebody's feelings. So, <coughs> this is why the, the, the name Al-Latif is it's different to just simply saying Al-Rafiq, because Rafiq we use for gentleness. Someone who is gentle, we say is Rafiq. But Latif encompasses gentleness, but at the same time, uh, knowledge of the finer matters. And that's why we say it's a name which carries the meaning of Al-Khabir and Al-Ra'uf. And that's why in the two verses that he quotes, uh, the name Al-Latif is mentioned alongside the name Al-Khabir. And this is something fascinating. Uh, uh, there was actually a PhD done by, I think it was a Palestinian scholar, um, studying the way Allah mentions His names alongside one another. And that's really interesting. Um, in Sheikh uh, Salman's book on the names and attributes of Allah, um, this was something that really interested him. And, uh, and this is when he came across his PhD thesis. That, because there's great significance, really, that when you see, because so many times, for example, what, what usually comes after Tawwab? Rahim, isn't it? And we said that holds significance because when Allah who forgives, um, is it a, a, a forgiveness which is a must? It's a forgiveness out of mercy, isn't it? It's a forgiveness that when Allah forgives, He forgives out of mercy. So, Latif is mentioned alongside uh, al khabir Now, um, there's a beautiful verse which I want you to reflect on um, in Surah Yusuf. Um, so this is Surah Yusuf verse... Uh, Um, uh, so chapter 12 verse 100 Yusuf salam, this is after he's been reunited with his family after he's been reunited with his family so he says وَقَدْ أَحْسَنَ بِي إِذْ أَخْرَجَنِي مِنَ السِّجْنِ that indeed he, I, my lord he was good to me when he took me out of the prison وَجَاءَ بِكُمْ مِنَ الْبَدُّ and he brought you from the outskirts of the city. مِنْ بَعْدِ أَنْ نَزَغَ الشَّيْطَانِ بَيْنِي وَبَيْنَ إِخْوَتِي And, so when he, he, he said, uh, indeed Allah will show Ihsan to me, okay, after he brought me out of the prison, and he brought you to me from the Bedouin, after, and this is the important point, after Shaytan had caused like disruption between me and my brothers. Between me and my brothers. Inna Rabbi Latifun Indeed, my Lord is the most subtle to whoever he wishes. 
إِنَّهُ وَالْعَلِيمُ الْحَكِيمُ Indeed, he's the all-knowing and the all-wise. <coughs> now, who caused the animosity between Yusuf and his brothers? Was it his brothers or Yusuf? It, it was his brother, isn't it? Yeah? His brothers caused all the problems. I mean, he was very innocent. He was a young person. Okay, they were very jealous of him. But look what he said when, when he spoke about shaitan, you know, sowing that discord between both of them. After shaitan had sowed that discord between me and my brothers. So, look at the order here. He didn't say what? Between my brothers and me. Between my brothers and me. And this ayah is amazing because he's describing, he's saying Allah is Latif, but we can see him being Latif in this ayah. Okay? Because when someone has done wrong to you, the last thing you want to do is remind them all the time. You did this to me. You, 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 you threw me in the well. You know? You're the one that was jealous of me. No, he, he wasn't like that, subhanAllah. He was not like that. And, you know, he didn't say, you know, shaitan, you know, so discord in your hearts towards me. No, shaitan, he put discord between me and my brothers. There's two things here. Firstly, he's saying me before he mentioned his brothers. And secondly, he's saying between me and my brothers. And he didn't say what? After shaitan had so discord in the hearts of my brothers. Was there any discord in the heart of Yusuf? Was there any bad feelings in the heart of Yusuf No. So look at the sensitivity of Yusuf He's so careful with his choice of words, he doesn't want to hurt his brothers. Even though his brothers wronged him. Even though his brothers wronged him. And it would have been absolutely normal and perfect for him to say, you know, after Shaitan had put discord, so discord in, 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 in the hearts of my brothers. And this is Yusuf السلام, being Latif. Okay? So a key aspect of being Latif is <coughs> being empathetic. Putting yourselves in the shoes of somebody else. And that is essential towards, uh, to, to, for a person to, to be an Latif. He puts himself in somebody else's shoes to make sure that he, uh, he can feel what the other person is feeling. And that's exactly the, the quality that Rasulullah used to have. And if you read his seerah and his biography, you'll find it full of Rasulullah being empathetic and, and gentle and subtle towards his companions. Whether it be, for example, when he um, corrected Mu'adh ibn Jabal, who used to lead the people in prayer, but he sometimes his salah was quite long. You know, so he said, Afatanam anta ya Mu'adh. Are you causing fitna between people or Mu'adh? You know, there's only women with children and old elderly people. Be considerate of other people. You know, prior to the death of Rasulullah we know that you know he, he spoke to the companions and said, if there's anyone that I have wronged, let me know now, so that they can take, you know, uh, uh, the qisas from me. And that's when, you know, one of the companions, he said, Ya Rasulullah, in one of the battles, you were straightening the rows, okay, you were straightening the rows and you poked me in my stomach with your staff. And so what did Rasulullah do? He lifted up his garment, subhanAllah. And even before that actually, he said, here, take the stick and poke me. And the Sahaba said, no, Ya Rasulullah. My stomach was, was bare, you could see my stomach. And so Rasulullah lifted up his garment and said, here, now poke me. SubhanAllah. So he's putting himself in other people's shoes. Empathy, sensitivity. A, a beautiful characteristic that Rasulullah used to have. Now, in terms of understanding this in light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, Al-Halimi, he described it as being هُوَ الَّذِي يُرِيدُ بِعِبَادِهِ الْخَيْرِ وَالْيُسْرِ وَيُقَيِّدْ لَهُمْ أَسْبَابَ الصَّلَاحِ وَالْبِرِّ 
that when applying this name to Allah, it means essentially that He is the one who wants good for His servants. He is the one who makes things easy for His servants. So He's so kind and subtle to His servants that He wants good for them. He wants good for them. He wants to facilitate things for them. And not just that, يُقَيِّدْ لَهُمْ أَسْبَابَ الصَّلَاحِ he, he gives to them the, uh, the abilities to attain that righteousness and bid. He makes it easy for that person to, to become more obedient uh, to him. So for example, this, this, this circle that we're sitting in is from the asbab, is from the causes, insha'Allah ta'ala, by which Allah wants good for His servants. If Allah wants good for a person, He gives him understanding of the religion. How does He give that? By facilitating them. By <coughs> circles that speak about Him, that speak about His deen. And that's from His lutf, that's from His subtleness and His kindness. Also from the manifestations of Allah being a latif, is that He does not um, take people to account immediately after they've committed the sin. That's another way as well, that he is subtle and kind. He doesn't take them all to account straight away. In fact, he gives them respite. He gives them respite. He gives them a chance to turn back and amend their ways. Um, also, and, and this is something which is really interesting, and another way that some of the scholars have explained how Allah is a Latif, that <coughs> they said that له العلم بدقائق المصالح that Allah has knowledge of the finer points, of the finest details of those things that, that are beneficial to man. Allah knows the intricate details of those things which are beneficial uh, to man. And going back to what I said, remember about the mothers, okay? Um, the mother always knows what is best for the child because they have developed this understanding and this knowledge of their child such that nobody else, and for example, if you give your child to, uh, to be looked after by somebody else, you give them a long list, isn't it? The things they like, the things they don't like, the things they can't have, the things that they can have, when they need to eat, when they usually do this, when they usually do that, okay? Because that's what's, that, that's the masalih, that's the welfare of the child. And, and what is fascinating is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is more aware of the things we need more than our own selves. Now you say to yourself, I know what is good for me. You can think that, that you, 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 you know what is good for you, what benefits you, you know what harms you, you know what you don't like. But Allah is more aware of that. Allah knows more than us about what is good for us and what is bad for us. And He facilitates those matters for us. Now, another manifestation <coughs> of Allah's uh, subtleness and gentleness is the way he has legislated his laws for his servants. His sharia is a manifestation of his kindness and subtleness. Now, this will probably take some thought and reflection because usually to the layman, it's usually quite the opposite. The Sharia is seen as something very strict and it's seen as, you know, uh, being very harsh and it's seen as being a test for the people. But in actuality, it's the opposite. Allah has made it easy. And um, one of the ways we understand that is through one of the methods of His legislation is that of Tadaruj, relation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gradually revealed the rulings so it became easy for the Muslims to, 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 to implement them. 
Salah, for example, wasn't made on obligation like straight away. People were praying even before the five obligatory prayers were prescribed. Even fasting, when fasting was first legislated, was it a must for everyone to do? People actually had the option to feed a poor person. You know? When alcohol was prohibited, was it done instantaneously? No, it was done gradually. So there was this tadabra of this gradation of like gradually passed these legislations, so that's a manifestation really of his subtleness and his kindness. And not only that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave many concessions, ruhsa, that if you do suffer difficulties in implementing these laws, Allah has made things easy for you. Allah says, He wants ease for you, He doesn't want difficulty for you. So if you're fasting and you're finding it difficult, when you're traveling, for example, you can break your fast. <coughs> okay? If you need to do wudu, you can't find water, you can do tayammu. Okay? If you're praying and you find it difficult to stand up and pray because you're ill, you can pray sitting. That's what Allah says, فَاتَّقُوا مَسْتَطَعْ Fear Allah as much as you possibly can. Why? لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. Because Allah does not burden a soul more than it can bear. But without a shadow of a doubt, the nature of the Sharia is that there is a certain degree of difficulty within the Sharia. We have to acknowledge that. Because if there wasn't, then the Sharia really wouldn't really be what a test. But this is a, a difficulty which is bearable. That's an important point. It's a difficulty which man can bear. Because why? Allah is Latif. He is Latif, He is subtle and He is kind. So when He does make certain things slightly difficult for you, He knows it's not beyond your capabilities. And if it is beyond your capabilities, Allah is not going to ask you to do it. Allah is not going to ask you to do it. So the Sharia, it's the Sharia of Rahman. The Sharia, Islamic law, it's a law of mercy, and we should view um, our ibadah as a manifestation of Allah's lutf, of His subtleness and kindness. Ask yourselves, for example, you think praying five times a day is difficult? When Allah first obligated salah, how many times did we have to pray? Fifty times. Fifty times. Imagine trying to pray fifty times a day. That's like literally every half an hour. Imagine you go to sleep, you have to wake up every half an hour to pray. <coughs> that would be like, you know, very difficult. So we should be ashamed of ourselves if we find it difficult to pray five times a day. We think, oh, five times is very difficult. SubhanAllah. It could be a lot worse. It could be, you know. Bani Israel, we spoke about their method of tawbah. What was their method of tawbah? Faqtulu and fusakum. Kill one another. How has Allah made tawbah for us though? You should have that sincere intention, that remorse, that regret, and the intention not to go back to the sin and stop committing the sin. And you will find Allah to be the most forgiving. So really upon reflection, you will find the Sharia to be a Sharia of subtleties and compassion and mercy. But it requires thought and reflection. Because on the onset, it, it doesn't seem like that. Most non-practicing Muslims, when they look at Sharia, they see it as being very strict, lots of prohibitions. Even though in Islam, we, we say there are more things allowed in Islam than there are things which are actually haram. Think about it. Think about, okay, the foods that are haram. Are there more halal food or more haram food? More halal food. Even living here in the West, amongst non-Muslims, we say there's more halal food than there is haram food. Okay, and that's from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <coughs> now, knowing that Allah is al Latif now, what are the consequences of knowing that Allah is al Latif, the most subtle, the most kind? Firstly, that um, the servant becomes more. Uh, aware of his own actions. He becomes more aware of his own actions. Why? Because what, what is one of the 
implications of Allah being al latif is that he's al-khabir, the well acquainted. He knows very well um, your circumstances. He knows your circumstances very, very well. Okay? So the person becomes more concerned about his actions. It also leads the person, secondly, to uh, reflect over the subtleties of Allah. You see, if, if, because if Allah is a latif, then this must mean that He is showing acts of subtleties and, 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 and kindness to us. So, for example, just reflect over your food. The food that we eat, for example, compared to other animals. Now, other animals, take for example rabbits. What do rabbits eat? Carrots, grass, okay, rabbit food maybe, they make and manufacture. That's about it, isn't it? Okay? Imagine human beings, all they ate was carrots and grass and nothing else. Okay? People become bored, isn't it? Allah has given us a diverse a range of food for us to eat, for our enjoyment, as a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And different types of food with different types of tastes. Sweet, sour, bitter, okay. So look how Allah has favoured man over many of his other creations. Look what, what, what horses eat, for example, they eat hay and grass, that's about it, nothing else. So, knowing that Allah is Latif should urge a person and push the person to reflect over the, the diversity of Allah's kindness and His love. <clears throat> Another manifestation is that the person should um, uh, try to characterize his own self with, with kindness and gentleness. He should also try to be gentle and kind. This was one of the characteristics of Rasulullah as we explained. And Rasulullah used to say, Man yahrum, man yuhram ar rifq, yuhram al khayr. Whoever is denied kindness, or whoever hasn't been given any kindness, then he will be denied any good. He will be denied any good. So, goodness that you have is associated with, with kindness. As far as one also used to say, that gentleness is not associated with something except that it beautifies it. And gentleness is never taken away except that it, 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 it mars it, it tarnishes it. And this beautiful hadith, and this is a beautiful hadith in Muslim and Ahmad, إِذَا أَرَادَ اللَّهُ بِأَهْلِ بَيْتٍ خَيْرًا أَدْخَلَ عَلَيْهِمْ رِفْقًا that if Allah wants good for a household, if He wants good for a home, Ahl al-Baytin, He enters upon him gentleness and kindness. And so you find, and there's so many ahadith that speak about rifq, that speak about gentleness and kindness, and how it is, it is linked to um, all forms of goodness. <clears throat> and and again, this is something we need to reiterate, but that gentleness and kindness can only really flourish if the person has that sensitivity and is empathetic towards the feelings of other people. Okay, so that's the name Al Al Latif. Uh, the next name we will look at, inshallah, is Al Al Hafiz or Al Hafiz, which is on page 18. Um, Al Hafiz. Um, there's another name of Allah similar to that, which is Al Hafiz. Al Hafiz. Now, <coughs> Sheikh Saadi explains it in the following way: the one who protects and preserves what he created and whose knowledge encompasses all that he brought into existence. The one who protects his friends from falling into sins and the destructive matters. 
the one who is kind to them during their periods of activity and rest, the one who accounts the actions of the servants and their rewards. And then he quoted the verse, and Iblis did prove true um, his thought about them, and they followed him, all except the group of the true believers, and Iblis had no authority over them, except that we might test um, he who believes in the hereafter from him who is in doubt about it, and your Lord is the guardian over everything. Another verse, as for those who take friends and protectors besides him, Allah is the guardian over them, and you are not a disposer of their affairs. Now, we're going to come back to this explanation of Saudi because uh, it's a very far explanation of it. Now, Al-Hafiz itself, it's been mentioned three times in the Qur'an. As for the name Al-Hafiz, then this has been mentioned once. Both names, Al-Hafiz and Al-Hafiz, they both originate from the word Hiv. Hafiz. Hafiz. Now, Hiv, we, 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 we're used to hearing this term to refer to memorizing the Qur'an. Okay, someone who's Hafiz, okay, usually mispronounced as Hafiz, okay, is actually Hafiz, someone who's a memorizer of the Qur'an, you say Hafiz. Uh, I mean, Hafiz is a more intensive form, but we, we don't usually use it for someone who's memorized the Qur'an. And linguistically, it, it literally means to, to guard something. That's why they've translated it here as a guardian. And why is that the case? Why is a Hafiz of Qur'an called a guardian? Because he has guarded the Qur'an and preserved it in his memory, preventing it from leaving him. Preventing it from leaving him. So he's guarded that Qur'an within him. And as we know, Rasulullah described the Qur'an as being ashaddu tafallutan. That it is something that, that leaves us very quickly like a camel which has not been tied. If you don't tie a camel, what will happen? The, the camel will just run off. The Qur'an is like that when it comes to memorizing. If you don't constantly revise your Qur'an, what will happen? You'll forget it. You'll forget it. Okay? So, from a linguistic perspective, it, 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 it is used to refer to preserving and safeguarding something. Therefore, how do we apply this to Allah? How do we apply this to Allah? He is the one who preserves and safeguards um, the universe and what is in it. That's the first thing. He preserves and safeguards the universe. He sustains the universe. So there's a meaning of a summit here. <coughs> okay, he preserves it. I mean, just look at the universe itself, the way the planets they orbit around the sun. Perfect system. You can clearly see there's someone controlling all of that. But more importantly for the believer, he is the one who preserves and safeguards his servants. How does he preserve and safeguard his servants? From what in particular? From two things, two destructive forces. The first is the destructive forces of, 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 of desires, shahawat. He protects them from them. And he also protects them from a shubuhat, those doubtful grey areas, concepts and ideas that can corrupt your aqidah, your belief. He protects you from those matters. And these are the two things that lead mankind astray. A person, people's desires and people's thoughts. So Al-Hafiz or Al-Hafiz is the one who protects you and preserves you from those two destructive elements. But in order to attain this hiv, this preservation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a person must do his role in that. And his role is to preserve the boundaries of Allah. When you preserve the boundaries of Allah, Allah will preserve you. And this is based upon the hadith, Rasulullah said, and this is when he taught Abdullah ibn Abbas, who was very young. And this is a, a very important lesson for us as 
as murabbis and educators and, and parents. Rasulullah uh, told Ibn Abbas, who was very young at that time, Ihfadillah Preserve, very literally preserve or safeguard Allah, but it means preserve the boundaries of Allah. Allah will preserve you. Ihfadillah That preserve the boundaries of Allah and you will find Allah in front of you. وَعْلَمْ أَنَّ الْأُمَّةَ And know that if the whole Ummah was to come together to, 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 to harm you, okay, they will not be able to harm you unless Allah had willed. And if the whole Ummah came to try and benefit you, they will not be able to benefit you unless Allah had willed. The pens have been lifted and the ink has dried. And know that victory comes uh, with sabr. Look, look at these concepts he's speaking about. He's speaking to a child. Subhanallah. He's speaking to a child about victory and sabr. You know, the closest we get to talking about victory is on a computer game. You know, with children. He's speaking about these, these important topics. And that's why one of the problems that we have is that um, sometimes we, we belittle our children and think that they don't understand these important topics. Okay? And you know our children are becoming that we're dumbing our children down. You know we have this we have children we have children who you know they're considered children at a young age and then they become teenagers and then they become adults. In some we don't have that. You're either a child or you're an adult. That's it. So in your teenage years, and that's the most destructive years you'll find for children because they're being fed that they are teenagers. That's what they're being, they're being told, you're a teenager. And when, you go, when you're in your teenage years, you suffer from a lot of difficulties. They even told that, you know, your, your hormones, they play about with you. If you're being told that, you're going to behave in that way. You're going, to be, you're going to behave in that way. And there's a stereotypical image of teenagers nowadays. When people speak about them, they're rebellious, they're this and that. If teenagers see this, this is how they're going to be. But if you treat them as adults, when they become mature, they will behave in that way. And that's how the Sahaba were. Rasulullah sent Usama ibn Zayd as a leader of an army at the age of 17. At the age of 17, he was a leader of an army, subhanAllah. So, you know, we should be imparting this type of knowledge to our young adults. Okay, we should speak to them on serious terms, and you know, make them understand that they are now responsible for their actions. It's not when you become 18 that you're responsible. No, when you're 12, 13, 14, that's when you become responsible for your actions. You are now a man. You're a woman at that age. Um, so anyway, <coughs> going back to the hadith, ihfadillah, preserve the boundaries of Allah, and Allah will preserve you. So in order to attain Allah's preservation, you must preserve the boundaries of Allah. And there are certain things that the Islam in particular um, encourages the preservation of. What acts of ibadah in particular does Allah focus on when it comes to preservation in the Quran? As-salah. Hafidhu ala salati Preserve your salah. Was salati al-wusta. And the middle prayer, in particular, which is Salat al-Asr. As many scholars say, وَقُومُوا لِلَّهِ قَانِتِينَ And this is why the scholars and the Rasulullah used to say, the one who doesn't pray his Asr, it's as if he's lost all of his wealth and all of his family. If you miss that one Salat. Now what does that mean? Imagine the regret and the remorse you will have and the sadness that you will have if you came home and you found all of your wealth and all of your family gone. How would you feel? Gutted. SubhanAllah. On the Day of Judgment, that is how you will feel when you find out you missed one Salat al Asr. So imagine years of that, SubhanAllah. So, Salat is something very, very important to preserve. Very, very important to preserve. Also, um, the scholars would mention preserving um, the, your, your private parts, Preserving your stomach and preserving your intellect. These are the key things that a person needs to be consciously aware of what he needs to protect and to guard. For example, Rasulullah used to say, whoever can guarantee um, 
guarantee for me that which is between his two jaw bones and between his two legs, i.e. his tongue and his private part, if you can guarantee those things for me, I will guarantee Jannah for you. I will guarantee Jannah for you. Preserving the stomach from intaking haram sustenances, overeating, etc. Preserving the intellect from taking in corrupt thoughts or becoming drunk. These are very, very important things to preserve. If you can preserve those things and preserve yourself from yourself according to haram, Allah will preserve you. And Allah preserves you in one of two ways. And this is something we've spoken about before. But He can preserve you on a very basic level, which is the preservation Allah gives even to many, you know, not many non-Muslims even. This is when He takes care of your, um, your, your health, your physical state, okay? And your provisions, etc. And he did that, as I said, even to many non-Muslims. And there was a very famous story of Imam Abu Tayyib al-Tabari, who I think I mentioned this story before. He was a very old shaykh and you know, reached a hundred years. He was walking with his students one day. He came across a hole in the floor and he jumped over the hole. He jumped over and the student said, why are you jumping over the hole, shaykh? Be careful, you're an old man. He said, no, these limbs of mine, these limbs of mine, I preserved them from haram when I was young. So Allah preserved them for me when I became old. Okay? So Allah even preserved, and that's why you find, and I, and I always mention this, that you know, the greatest scholars of Islam, they literally taught until the day they died. Okay, many of us, you know, once we reach the age of, you know, we become an old age pensioner, you know, everything slows down, you know, we stop doing the things that we generally tend to do. Okay? We can't perform ibadah like we used to when we were young. But if you really preserved yourself when you were young, Allah will give you that strength and ability. You know, so I remember one, one of my teachers, he was, uh, he was in his 70s. And the, the class that we would have, we sometimes used to be on the, the fourth floor of a building. He would race me to the top of the stairs at the age of 70. And he used to be... You know, so he had that much energy, subhanAllah. So I was like, you know, panting when I got to the top. But you see that, and you know, the, there was a clip of Sheikh Ibn Hussaymin, uh, you know, just a few days before he passed away, and he was teaching in the Haram, in Mecca. And you could even hear it in his voice that his life is leaving him, gradually. But he's still teaching. He's still teaching. He was still teaching, subhanAllah. And not only that, Allah doesn't just preserve you, but He preserves your family as well, based on your preservation of His religion. If <coughs> when we look to the story of Musa and Khidr in the Quran, we know that they passed by, uh, you know, they had, there was a number of incidences there. One of them was, though, that they came across a, a group of people who were very, um, uh, they, were, they were not very hospitable. So Musa and Khidr, they came and, you know, they wanted to be taken in. But they weren't very hospitable. And so Khidr, um, he saw there was a wall that was broken and he wanted to rebuild the wall. But without, obviously, they aren't very hospitable, so they don't want to pay him for anything. So Musa said to him, look, these people, they treated you so badly. Why are you doing it for free? So Khidr, he responded and he said, underneath, essentially, this wall, there's treasure. Okay, and it belongs to two orphans. But what did he say? وَكَانَ أَبُوهُمَا صَالِحًا فَأَرَادَ رَبُّكَ That their father was a righteous man. These two people, these two young orphans, their father was a righteous man. So Allah wanted to preserve that wealth of theirs underneath that wall until they became old. So when they became old, they'll be able to extract the, the treasure. Whereas if the wall was broken, people could just scatter around and they would, they would find the, and the, the treasure would come up. But the key thing was, is what? What did he de describe their father as being righteous? So because of the righteousness of the father, the children were preserved. Because of the righteousness of the father, the children were preserved. So that's one of the benefits of preserving the boundaries of Allah. But the second and the most noblest form of, the more noble form of preservation is when Allah he preserves not just your health and your wealth and your provisions, is that when He preserves your deen. He preserves your deen. 
and that is what the, 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 the most significant meaning of al hafiz is. He protects you. The other day, subhanAllah, I was, uh, uh, I was speaking to my wife about um, you know, some of the problems that a lot of sisters face nowadays. And there's one of her friends which uh, she's going through a lot of hardship. And she's the only practicing person in her family. Okay, and you know her brothers are like drug users, and you know the house get raided. The house, her house gets raided all the time by police, and you know, Subhanallah, what a difficult circumstance to be in. Yeah. And then you reflect, you think, Subhanallah, look at our situation. Look how easy it is for us to pray, to fast, to do these things. And then you have people that live in an environment like that, and they struggle just to perform the basic acts of ibadah. So really Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes things a lot easy for us. It makes things very, very easy for us. And that's something we should really appreciate. And that's why whenever um, uh, you end up performing the ibadah, you need to be grateful to the fact that Allah has given you that tawfiq. Okay, really it requires a lot of gratitude to Allah. That the fact that you are able to perform these acts of ibadah. Now, <coughs> another manifestation of Allah's um, hiv is that He preserves the, the, the deeds of the righteous and the evildoers. وَإِنَّ عَلَيْكُمْ لَحَافِظِينَ كِرَامًا كَاتِبِينَ Allah even describes one of the uh, characteristics of the angels as being hafizin, protectors or guardians or people who keep a watch over you because they write down your deeds. Now that could be viewed in two ways because if you're righteous then this instills hope in you because you know that the deeds that you're doing will not go to waste because Allah has preserved those deeds of yours. They will never go to waste. And this is actually what happened with the Sahaba. They were worried at one stage that we're doing all of these good deeds, but we don't see them recorded anywhere. So what will happen to our deeds? So Allah revealed what as a response? What surah did Allah reveal? Qad aflaha al-mu'minun. And we usually translate that as successful indeed are the believers. But that's not what it really means. And when we use the word qad in the Arabic language, one of the meanings it conveys that of tahqiq, which is actualization, meaning the believers have already achieved success. So you don't need to worry. Allah is aware of your deeds. He knows what you're doing. So this gives hope to the believer. But at the same time, it also instills fear for those who commit sin. Because Allah is not Nasiya, He is not someone who forgets. All your sins will be recorded down. So knowing that Allah is Hafid instills hope for the righteous, but it instills fear in the hearts of those who commit sins and transgress against Him. Allah does not forget. Not like human beings. With human beings sometimes we forget the mistakes of other people and the sins that people commit. And this is one of the problems with, with human beings, is that sometimes you know, we've committed many, many sins years ago. Okay, and they're just in the back of our memories. We've committed those sins in the back of our memories. And, you know, we tend to belittle those sins. Because we think, oh, we've done that many, many years ago. That was many years ago. But no, Allah doesn't forget. Allah subhanahu wa doesn't forget. He, he, and he will remind you every single action that you did. All of those actions were preserved. And this is why the human being is described as being valuman. He's described as being someone who's unjust to his own self. Because he does wrong to himself, but then he carries on as if he hasn't done any wrong. And that's the person destroying himself. Okay, the effects of knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-hafiz. <coughs> Firstly, the person... Um, and this is something which we mentioned, but we'll briefly point to. Firstly, the, 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 the person himself will um, be more conscious of preserving the boundaries of Allah because he knows that Allah will preserve him as a result of that. And, and he preserves him in two ways, as we know. 
Um, also, uh, one of the things that Allah preserves as well is um, the Quran. Verily, we have sent down this reminder, this Qur'an, and verily we shall preserve it. So the Qur'an is free from being tampered from, with. It will not be changed, it will not be altered, will, nothing will be added to it, nothing will be subtracted from it. Allah has preserved it. So that instills in a believer a sense of... Uh, Okay, it instills in a person a strong iman knowing that Allah will preserve the, the Quran itself. One of the du'as of Rasulullah was, uh, was related to him. Allah mahfazni min bayna yadayhi. Oh Allah, protect me and safeguard me from in front of me, wa min khalfi, from behind me, from, from behind me, wa an yameni, wa an shamali. From Shimali and from my right and from my and, and, and my left, from in Fawqi and protect me from above. So the, this is one of the things that we should try and incorporate with, within our supplications. Oh Allah, protect us, safeguard us. Allah Muhafazni. Okay, and this is a phrase that we usually say when referring to people of knowledge. When they when we, when someone's passed away, we refer to them as. Rahimahullah, may Allah have mercy upon him. If he's alive, Hafidahullah, may Allah preserve him, may Allah protect him. That's not just for people of knowledge, okay? That should be for every believer, for yourself. Okay, make that dua for yourself. Allahumma hafazni. Just a simple dua. Allahumma hafazni. Allahumma ihfazni. Oh Allah, protect me, uh, protect my iman, protect my health, etc. Okay, that's, uh, we'll stop at that for Al Hafiz. The, the next name that I want to discuss, the quote some time, so we'll probably um, do half of it now, which is Ar Razzaq, the provider, which in your notes it's on. Ah, I forgot to, sorry, just to go back to um, uh, what Shah Sa'di said about Al Hafiz. Let's just read that again. <coughs> <coughs> the one who protects and preserves what he created and whose knowledge encompasses all that he brought into existence. The one who protects his friends from falling into sins and destructive matters. So the destructive matters are related to desires and doubts, as we said. And the one who's kind to them during their periods of activity and rest. And that's really interesting. Um, the one who is kind to them during their periods of activity and rest. Now, human beings, they suffer from weaknesses and times where they're not feeling very, very strong. Those moments are, um, are a critical point for the believer because that is when it's very likely that a person can fall into sin. It's very likely for the person to fall into sin. That's why it's very important that you have that protection from Allah during those moments of uh, rest. And that's why Rasulullah said that um, once the companions complained to him, that, you know, when we are with you, O oh, Rasulullah, you know, we feel as though, you know, we are walking in the gardens of Jannah. When we go back to our families, you know, we, we are reminded of the dunya, etc. Rasulullah said, if you can remain in that same state when you are with me, the angels will come and they will shake your hands. If you can remain in that state. But there is a time for this and there is a time for that. Meaning that to achieve that state, I mean, for example, when we're in the masjid here, our iman is, is rise, you know, we, we are remembering Allah, we go home, you know, we get tempted by the dunya. To remain in the same state, it's, it's something very difficult to ask. It is very, very difficult. If you can achieve that state, then alhamdulillah, but there is a time for this and there is a time for that. Okay? So, the person needs to have moments of recreation, but the important thing is he doesn't fall into haram. He doesn't fall into haram when he has those moments of recreation and play and amusement. And this is really important for the youth. Now, something that um, uh, a lot of people ask, uh, maybe it's not pertaining to everyone sitting here, 
But people who are very keen on seeking knowledge, one of the, 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 the things that they ask is, you know, should I get married now or should I get married later? Because the scholars of the past, they would actually encourage um, you know, students of knowledge to get married when they were really late. <coughs> like Imam Ahmad, rahimahullah, Ahmad ibn Hanbal, uh, he was 40 years old when he got married. That's, that's quite old, okay? And so they would, you know, people would discourage, scholars would discourage students of knowledge, serious students of knowledge from getting married. Because why? They need to dedicate all of their time to seeking knowledge. But the youth of today, are not that, they're not of that calibre. We have to make that clear. Because they, no matter how much eagerness they have to seek knowledge, they will not spend their entire, day, their entire days and nights seeking knowledge. They'll read a book for a few hours a day, and that will be all. So what are they going to do with the rest of their time? What are you going to be doing the rest of the day? You need to be making sure you're not falling into sin. Because as soon as you have that free time, that's when the doors of shaitan, they open to you. Okay, so being preserved, Allah to preserve you in times of uh, 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 inactivity is extremely, extremely important. And you need to be consciously aware that when you don't have many things to do, that's when shaitan is going to work very, very hard with you. Very, very hard with you. And so, you know, to, to make you fall and to slip and to fall into hell. Okay, so the next name, let's, let's begin inshallah, is ar razzaq which we said is on page uh, 22, <coughs> at the bottom, and uh, it actually carries on to the next page. So the provider, the one who provides for all of his servants, there is not a creature on the earth except that Allah provides for it. His providing for his servants is of two types. The general provision which extends to the righteous and to the sinner, the first and the last. This is a provision that is required by the bodies. The specific provision, this being granted to the hearts, nourishing them with knowledge and faith. Also, the lawful provision that has been appointed for the benefit of the religion. This being specific to the believers and apportioned in accordance to their different levels of what his wisdom and mercy dictates. And then he quotes, Say, come, I will recite to you what your Lord has prohibited you from. So join on anything in worship of him, be good and dutiful to your parents, kidnap your children because of poverty, we provide sustenance for you and for them, come not near shameful sins, over openly or secretly, kill not anyone who Allah has forbidden except for a just cause, this he has commanded that you may understand. And, uh, and they say, so we provide, the, the point being here, we provide sustenance for you and them. So don't kill your children out of fear of poverty. We will provide for them and we provide for you. Now, this is a, we'll come back to this verse. And then uh, there's another verse here, I created man and jinn only that they may worship me. I seek not any provisions from them nor do I ask that they feed me. Indeed, Allah is the provider, Ar-Razzaq, the owner of power, the most strong. Now, the name Ar-Razzaq, um, <clears throat> it's a name that, it's a name that uh, occurs once in the Qur'an in the singular form. Ar-Razzaq, in the singular form. But in terms of, in the, in, in the plural form, it has been mentioned a number of times. Uh, and Tahir Raziqin. Raziqin is a plural form. So you're the best of those who provide. And that's in, in the plural form is being mentioned five times. But as an action, it's mentioned so many times. So there are a number of places where it's mentioned as a verb. So don't think that you know, oh, it's only been mentioned once. No, as a verb, the fact that Allah describes that He provides, it's something which is recurrently is, is mentioned time and time again in the Quran. Now, razak, it, it comes from the word rizq, rizq, which we usually translate as provisions. And from a linguistic perspective in the Arabic language, a rizq it refers to something which a person benefits from. 
Now, it's better that we understand rizq like that because if you tell people rizq is provisions, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Food, clothing, etc. Yeah? So we look at it purely from the, um, the physical aspects, the tangible things, provisions. Whereas in the Arabic language, we use two words for provisions. We use rizq and we use another word which is called qut. Q-O-O-T. Qut. And one of the names of Allah is Al-Muqeet. Yeah. Now, Qut is provisions as well. But what's the difference? Qut refers to the physical provisions that you need to stay alive. Food, clothing, shelter. So, what we refer to as Rizq, really it is Qut. So, what is Rizq therefore? Rizq is more extensive and more generic than Qut. Qut, we said, it just relates to the physical and the tangible you know, provisions. But Allah is ar razzaq He provides us with spiritual sustenance. And that is the greatest form of sustenance. That's the greatest form of sustenance. But that's what we fail to understand. Because when we refer to Allah as razzaq the only thing that comes to our mind is what? food, clothing, shelter, drink, and what have you. But the greatest thing that he provides is Iman and Taqwa. <coughs> okay? And that's why, look at this verse. Allah says, Whoever has Taqwa of Allah, Allah finds it out a way for him. And he provides him from a means in which he will he, he cannot perceive. Now when many of us read this verse, we think of wealth. That if you have taqwa of Allah, Allah will increase you in rizq. He will increase you in wealth, He will increase you in sustenance. Which is true, without shadow of a doubt. Because obedience leads to an increase of provisions. But there is also another meaning of this verse, which is that if you have taqwa of Allah, Allah will increase you in guidance. Okay? Because Allah says, um, uh, uh, that Allah increases in guidance those who are guided. Allah increases in guidance those who are guided. So if you are guided, Allah increases you in that guidance. And that is the greatest form of provision. And that's why Shaykh Sa'adi, when he explains uh, al razaq he says there are two types of provision. So the general which is in essence what he's referring to, he's referring to qut, okay, he's referring to the food and what have you, and the specific provision, which is the most important provision, is being granted to the hearts, nourishing them with knowledge and faith. Nourishing them with knowledge and faith. Now, one of the du'as of Rasulullah one of the first things he used to say when, um, uh, it, it, it was one of his supplications in the morning. Allahumma inni as'aluka ilman nafi'an wa rizqan tayyiban wa amalan mutaqabbalan. That's one of the first du'as that he used to make during the day in the mornings. Oh Allah, grant me beneficial knowledge and a good form of rizq and actions which are to be uh, accepted. Okay, um, so we spoke about the difference between uh, Rizq and Qut. Um, <coughs> there are other manifestations of uh, uh, of this name which I think we will we'll leave until after Salah, inshallah. So we'll just stop there or we'll break for Salah, but we'll resume after that, inshallah. <coughs> So continuing on with our discussion of al Raza, those of you who have joined us today, we started before uh, Um There's some key features about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being al Raza that we need to be aware of. And one of them is that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides, um, it doesn't cause any difficulty upon Allah. 
He doesn't lose out on anything by providing us. Whereas human beings, when we provide and we give sustenance to other people, then it affects what we have at the end. We know in the very famous hadith, which is uh, a hadith Qudsi, which uh, the hadith, Ya ibadi, O my servants, inni haramtu thulma ala nafsi wa jaantu ubaynakum muharramat fa asadharam. O my servants, very I have um, forbidden injustice upon myself. And so I've made it for forbidden amongst yourselves so do not treat yourselves unjustly. Uh, this hadith, by the way, Hadith Qudsi, was considered to be the most noble hadith that the scholars of Asham used to narrate. And they used to take great pride in this hadith because all of the narrators of this hadith were from Asham, which is present day you know, Syria, Palestine. And I find it quite befitting um, that they narrated this hadith and what is happening to the Muslims in Asham that's taking place. I mean, you need to read the whole hadith, it's quite a long hadith. It's in the 40 hadith of Imam Nawi, I think it's hadith number uh, 28, I think, somewhere near there. So it's a well-known hadith, please look at that. Part of that hadith, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ibadi, O my servants, Law anna awwalakum wa akhirakum wa insakum wa jinnakum qamu fi sa'idin wahidin fasa'aluni fa'a'ataytu kulla insani mas'alatu ما نقص ذلك مما عندي إلا كما ينقص المخلط إذا أدخل البحر. <coughs> oh my servants, the first of you and the last of you, the mankind of you, the jinn of you, were to stand in one platform, and you all asked me for something, and I gave every single person, human being and jinn, from the beginning of creation to the end of time, what he wanted. That would not decrease what I have. That would not decrease what I have. Except if you were to put a needle into a sea. If you were to put a needle into a sea and you were to take the needle out, how much water has decreased from that sea? It's not even measurable. You can't you won't be able to measure it. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides, He can provide, but nothing, He doesn't lose out on anything. And it's a key feature of Allah's ability to provide. Another aspect is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides without, um, uh, regardless of faith, regardless of what faith you have, Allah will still provide. So you'll provide to the believers and you'll provide to the disbelievers. And that's why in the very famous hadith, um, the, the Rasulullah said, مَا أَحَدٌ أَسْبَرُ عَلَى الْأَذَى uh, that there is no one who is more patient upon hearing harm than Allah. Uh, they ascribe to him a son, but then Allah, he, he safeguards them and he continues to provide for them. So they ascribe a son to him, but he still provides for them. Whereas with, with human beings, if, if someone treats you unjustly, you're not going to give them a single penny. He won't give them a single penny. But that's the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides. And even if you transgress against him, he'll still provide for you. Now, but this is related to the next point, which is that when Allah provides, this doesn't necessarily mean that he loves that individual. And this is very important, especially for us living here in the West, where we live generally like affluent lives and you know we, we enjoy a certain degree of luxury and comfort. It does not necessarily mean that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves you. Uh, and, and this is what unfortunately what, what, what increased the disbelievers in their disbelief. Because they thought, look, if Allah, you know, is not happy with what we are upon, then why are we enjoying all of this? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, quotes them and this is a verse of Surah Saba, verse uh, 35 to 37. <coughs> that they said, we have more wealth and we have more children. So why would, you know, we're not going to be punished. Meaning we are blessed. We are blessed. 
قل إن ربي يبسط الرزق لمن يشاء ويقدر ولكن أكثر الناس لا يعلمون. Say to them though that Allah He gives His provisions to whoever He wishes and He withholds from whoever He wishes. ولكن أكثر الناس لا يعلمون. But most people don't know that. Most people do not know. What do they? What don't they know? They don't know the wisdom how Allah provides and why He provides to certain people. So you will have an ex, an, you know, a certain amount of wealth. You don't know whether that wealth it's really a blessing or a test. <coughs> Can you guarantee that? The wealth, that, the comfort that you are experiencing in this dunya. Can you say to yourself and be absolutely certain this is manifestation of Allah's love of me, He loves me for my ibadah, or is it a test? Allah is testing to see if I am grateful or not. We can't guarantee even. That's why the believer is always in a state of worry and concern with regards to his wealth. Is this Allah testing the person and uh, making him enjoy all of the worldly delight so that in the hereafter he might get hardly anything, if not nothing. And then that's in fact one of the reasons why Allah he gives to the disbelievers all that they want, because at the end of the day, that's what all the enjoyment they're going to get, because they're going to get nothing of it in the hereafter. And that is what made many of the companions really concerned and worried when they were, whenever they would experience luxury. Because they thought that this is maybe Allah giving us to it early, that means we're not going to get it in the hereafter. It used to make them worry, but nowadays it just makes us more happy. It makes us more happy. And, and that's a sign that we are attached to the dunya. <coughs> the more wealth that we have, we become so happy, and when we decrease in wealth, we become really sad. That's a sign of attachment to the dunya. Whereas the believer is a zahid, he's an ascetic. He is someone who, whether his wealth was to increase or his wealth was to decrease dramatically, he would view it in the same light. He would view it in the same light, and that is what true zuhud is. And that is why uh, one of the scholars from the Salaf, when he was, he was given like a huge um, amount of wealth, and he began to cry, and he wasn't crying out of happiness. He said, how am I going to respond to Allah on the Day of Judgment with all this wealth that He has given to me? This is a responsibility now. If you today, if you were to give a sack of gold to someone or a bag of money, look how they'll jump up for joy. He wants to be a millionaire. <laughs> look how they respond. It's, it's, it's really subhanAllah. You know, they, uh, these game shows, and, I, and that's why I really, Muslims shouldn't be watching these game shows. Because that's just going to make you be in their position. And I find it fascinating how Muslims are interested in these shows, really. We should be disgusted at their attitude. We really should be disgusted at their attitude, how when they get some wealth, they jump up for joy. And, SubhanAllah. That day you'll be asked about all the delights you had in this world. On a side note as well, there are other shows as well that uh, I think Muslims <coughs> should, should be cautious whether they should be watching. In one show in particular, which is The Apprentice. Okay, and I know many Muslims watch it. But I would ask yourself, really, should you be watching a program like that? Why? Because the people that participate in that show, contestants, they're working against one another. They backbite, they lie, they cheat, they try to step over another person. For the type of characteristics you want to be learning and gaining. I mean, personally, when I see that show, I just, you know, I just can't stand it. Because I just see bad akhlaq. And when the believer sees bad akhlaq, he flees from it, he flees from it. He doesn't enjoy it. That's just equivalent to listening to gossip and enjoying it. And what's the ruling of listening to gossip and enjoying it? It's not good for the believer. Really, it's not. So, you know, the believer, you know, Rasulullah said, Inna Allah yuhibu ma'ani al-umur wa yakrahu Allah, He loves the noble affairs. He loves the noble affairs. And He dislikes those lowly affairs of people. Now tell me one thing, watching The Apprentice, like, are you watching noble affairs? Or are you watching lowly people just debase one another? <coughs> really? So, anyway, that's my personal view. I know many people disagree. So. Um, 
Now, also, so this is an important point that so when Allah provides, <coughs> it's not a guarantee that <coughs> it's not a guarantee that Allah loves that person. Perhaps it could be the case that this is Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala uh, testing that individual. Another verse as well, Surah so Al-Mu'minun, verse fifty-five. Do they think that that which we are giving to them of wealth and children, that we are increasing them in good? But no, they cannot perceive, they cannot feel what is really happening to them. And the problem with many of us Muslims is that when we look to the Western world, we become dazzled and you know we see oh look at them they have advanced so much in technology and organization and you know and you know muslims they, they, they aspire to come here and live in the west because of that and they and they look down upon muslims they look down upon muslims they think oh these muslims are so backward you know we should have we should be like them subhanallah we don't realize that maybe Allah is giving all of this to them. He's giving them the ability to be well organized, the ability to, you know, uh, to be so well structured and organized and produce a lot of, you know, financial goods and what have you. Allah has given that, given them that ability as a form of punishment for them. This is what the Quranic concept is known as istidraj, istidraj, which is gradual punishment. He gradually Allah says we will gradually take them step and step and step in a way that they will not even perceive. They won't even they won't even realize that Allah, this is Allah actually testing them and, and you know and, and punishing them. <clears throat> okay, the, the next point is that the taqwa of Allah is something which increases Allah's risk. Taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that which increases your provisions. Uh, and there are so many verses in the Quran that point to that point. For example, in Surah Al-Ma'idah, verse 66. That if they had, like the people of the book, if they had established the, the Torah and the Gospels and what was revealed to them from their Lord, then they would have eaten from above them and from what is underneath their feet. Meaning Allah would have provided for them from all angles if they established the, the Torah and the Injil. Like I said, Al-A'raf, verse 96, <clears throat> That if only the people of the town, they had believed and had taqwa of Allah, We would have opened up for them blessings from the heavens and from the earth. So taqwa of Allah plays a huge role in, in Allah providing for you. The opposite is also very true, that when you disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah can take away your provisions and take away your blessings and decrease them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, <laughs> لِيُذِيَقُمْ بَعْضَ الَّذِي عَمِلُوا لَعَلَّهُمْ مُرْجِعُونَ In Surah Al-Rum, verse 41, a corruption appears on land and sea due to what the hands of men have burnt. So that they can taste some of what they did as a result. And so in order that perhaps they may return back to the truth. So corruption appears on land and sea, instability, Poverty, all of these things occur as a result of what the hands of men have earned. We can't just simply point it to our rulers and say, oh, our rulers are just usurping all of our wealth and, you know, they're just keeping it amongst themselves. Okay? We can't just point to them because as the ulama used to say, However the ummah is, that is how your rulers will be. Simple, simple equation. This is a Quranic equation. However you are, that is how your rulers will be. And in fact, Rasulullah he said that you know, when, uh, uh, when people go against their covenant with Allah, Allah will smite them with a punishment from their own selves. Allah will punish them through their own people when you go against the covenant of Allah. 
Okay. Another hadith that Ibn Umar Rasulullah said, إِذَا تَبَايَعْتُمْ بِالْعِينَ That when you engage in transactions which involve riba, interest, وَأَخَذْتُمْ بِأَذْنَابِ الْبَقَرِ And you, you take hold to the tails of the cows, وَرَضِيْتُمْ بِالزَّرْعِ And you become satisfied with the cultivation of the land. Meaning you become people who are become dunyafied. وَتَرَكْتُمُ الْجِهَادِ And you leave jihad in the way of Allah, سَلَّطَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْكُمْ ذُلَّةً Allah will smite you with humiliation. And He will not remove this humiliation until you return to your religion. Until you return to your religion. Okay, so I, 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 this is really an important point because sometimes we point the fingers in the wrong direction. I'm not saying we turn a blind eye to the corruption that is appearing. No, that, that is happening. No, <coughs> our, our rulers are to blame. <coughs> Then we will by the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then we need to take them into account. But at the end of the day, it all goes back to the state of the Ummah. Our state. Us. And that's why Rasulullah used to say that, you know, when, uh, uh, when you stop giving zakat, Allah withholds the rain from the heavens. When, if you stop paying zakat, look what happens. And if it wasn't for the, the animals, you wouldn't even have a single drop of water. Not even a single drop of water, if it wasn't for the animals. So, your disobedience, has our disobedience, has a huge impact on the state of the affairs of the Ummah. We don't realize that. I mean, we don't even realize this, this, the smallest things can have such a huge impact. <coughs> Rasulullah reported in a hadith in Shukun Abu Dawood that this Ummah will continue to remain in a good state as long as they hasten to break in their fast. I find this hadith amazing. This Ummah will continue to remain in a good state as long as you hasten to break your fast. And you might think, what on earth has hastening to break your fast got to do with the, with the state of the Ummah? Surely this is a, a minor affair. This is not a major affair. This is just as, you know, they say like in Arabic, the lub and the pishab, they say the, 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 the seed and the, and the, and the, uh, the peel. Okay, this is just one of those minor affairs. No, because this is an indication if the Muslim is very eager to, to fulfill the basic, you know, the basic sunnahs. If they have that eagerness to do that, then obviously there will be people who will be fulfilling all of their obligations and staying away from their major sins. Isn't it? If someone is not fulfilling his obligations and he's committing major sins, he's not going to be that bothered about how soon he breaks his fast. Who would be concerned about breaking his fast? Not just the person who's really hungry, but okay, but the person who has a strong desire to follow the Sunnah of Rasulullah. So, in essence, it's our connection to the Sunnah or what leads to the good state of affairs of um, of this Ummah. The final point I want to mention about uh, the, the, the rizq is that. I mean, I've mentioned that the greatest form of rizq that Allah provides for us is, is that of Iman. But that's in the dunya. But otherwise, the greatest rizq that Allah can really give you is Jannah. And that's if you take into consideration the hereafter. That is the greatest provision. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, He says uh, uh, in Surah Al-Hajj, verse 58, and listen to this ayah very carefully. <coughs> وَالَّذِينَ هَاجَرُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ ثُمَّ قُتِلُوا أَوْ مَاتُوا Those who migrated in the way of Allah, then they were killed. أَوْ مَاتُوا Or they died on their journey. Allah will provide them with rizqan hasana. Allah will provide them with a very good provision. وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَهُ الْخَيْرُ الرَّاسِقِينَ Allah is the best of providers. And what are these people going to get? People who die in the way of Allah in jihad or hijrah. They get jannah. So Allah, He describes jannah as being rizq. And the next verse makes it even clearer. Surah Al-Talaq, verse 11. وَمَنْ يُحْمُ بِاللَّهِ وَيَعْمَلْ صَالِحًا Whoever believes in Allah and does good deeds, يُدْخِلْهُ جَنَّاتٍ تَجْرِي مِنْ تَحْتِهَا الْأَنْهَارِ Allah will enter him into paradises and believe which rivers flow. They will reside therein for eternity. Indeed, Allah 
was good to him. Allah had perfected, showed beneficence in his rizq to him by providing him al-jannah. Likewise, he describes uh, the gifts in paradise. Allah says in Surah Sa'd, verse 54, Inna hadha marizquna. This is our provisions that we give to the believers. Ma lahu min nafat. And he will never deplete. He will never deplete. So Allah describes Jannah, the various enjoyments of Jannah, as a form of rizq. And so this is the, one of the greatest forms of rizq that we can truly ask for. Okay, so when you ask for rizq, don't think you're just asking for worldly things. Remember, we need to distinguish between qut and rizq. You have one aspect of your provisions, which is the food, clothing, but the other aspect of rizq is the iman and the taqwa. And then you have the rizq of Jannah itself. On a final point, actually, just before we conclude on this point of uh, rizq, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there are a couple of attributes that he has and some names that I feel Muslims, they have completely ignored or they have brushed aside. So one of them is the fact that Allah is a razzaq and that he is a shafi, the cure of illnesses. So what ends up happening is that when we seek provisions, our hearts solely depend on those who physically give us money. And when we are ill, our hearts completely depend on the medication itself. Paracetamol. Yeah. <laughs> Anything goes wrong, get the paracetamol. You never think of Allah. Allah has given, He has made human beings and He has made medicines as a means by which He provides and a means by which He cures. And that is what should be in our hearts when we seek provisions. When you receive that pay packet, don't think it's coming from that person. He's just a means. Allah is using him. So who should your heart really rely upon? Likewise, when you take medicine, and nearly most Muslims you'll find they suffer from this, their heart is relying on that medicine itself. They think that medicine is going to cure them. Allah is a shafi. And the shafi, Rasulullah used to say, Allah, you are the cure. You're the one who cures. You're the curer. But the medicine is just a means by which he cures. And the problem is, if we end up just depending on the medicine, this is a form of shirk. Really it is. It's a form of shirk. If you end up thinking, the medicine is going to cure me, and you don't even think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you are ascribing something which belongs to Allah alone. You're ascribing the ability to cure, which only belongs to Allah. The ability to cure only belongs to Allah. It doesn't belong to any of anybody else. Okay, so be really, really careful of this point. Because I feel as though many of us are, you know, we have a deficient understanding and application of that. <coughs> okay, we will start the final name now, inshaAllah. <coughs> which I'd like to discuss, uh, Shakur. <coughs> Page 30. I want you to do Al Ghani as well. I'll see if we have some time, we could do Al Ghani as well. Otherwise, let's just start with uh, a Shukur. Um, or a Shakir. So he's got both of these down here it's a Shakir, the recognizer and the rewarder of good, and a Shakur, the appreciative. The one who recognizes and rewards even the small quantity of action, forgives a large quantity of sins. He is the one who multiplies the rewards of his sincere servants manifold without any measure. He is the one who recognizes and rewards those who give, him, uh, give thanks to him and remembers the one who remembers him. Whosoever seeks to get close to him by doing any righteous action, Allah draws close to him by a greater degree. And then he quotes the, a couple of verses here. This is the verse in Surah Baqarah, verse 158. In, uh, indeed, Safa and Marwa are from the two symbols of Allah. So it's not a sin on him who performs Hajj or Umrah to perform the going between them. And whoever does good voluntary uh, you know, actions, then Allah is the recognizer. Shakurun Ali, the all knowing. 
Another verse, indeed, those who recite the Book of Allah and establish the prayers and spend out of that which we have provided them secretly and openly hope for a sure trade gain that will never perish. That he may pay them in full and give them even more out of his grace. He is of forgiving the appreciative. Ashabur. Now, the this, the reason why I've chosen and, and it's really to end with, with, with this name is because uh, I believe many people have a lot of difficulties in understanding this name. Because the word Shakur or Shakir, okay, by the way, Shakur has been mentioned four times in the Quran, and Shakir has been mentioned twice. Because a human being is also described as being Shakir and also Shakur. But we have usually translated for regards to a human being. Someone who shakir is what? Huh? How do you translate shakir for a human being? If he shakir, we say he is grateful. Okay? So, how does this apply to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Obviously, both terms shakur and shakir come from the word shukr. And as we know, shukr means gratitude. Okay? And when does gratitude arise? When someone has done some goodness and shown you some goodness, isn't it? You are grateful to that person. And it's as if the, the connotation is that the person has received something that he needs, so he's grateful to that person. Like we are in need of Allah's guidance, His provisions, etc. And therefore we are grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Allah is in need of nothing. He doesn't need anything. So why should He be grateful to us? Okay, and this is where the ishkar or the ambiguity arises. Now, to understand this point, the, the best way to understand shukr or gratitude, as the scholars will say, ma'arifatul insan, ihsan. That's what it really means. Irfan al ihsan wa nashid. It's essentially, shukr really means a person acknowledges an act of kindness. Acknowledges the act of kindness. That's the essence of gratitude. Most people though, when it comes to gratitude, if you were to ask them, okay, and I think I've asked you this before, I don't know, but let me ask you this. How are you grateful to Allah? How do you manifest your gratitude to Allah? It's a general question, it's not a trick question. It's Huh? You worship him, you thank him, okay? You be obedient to him, good. Okay, so that's what I was expecting. But there's very few people that would say you are grateful to Allah by recognizing that He has given you that blessing. Now think about it from this perspective. If you don't recognize you've received a blessing from Allah, will you even be grateful to Him? Being grateful to Him by thanking Him with your tongue and performing the ibadah is based on the premise that you have recognized that He has blessed you. If you don't recognize that point, you're not going to bless Him for it. You're not going to, sorry, be grateful to Allah for that. And that's why the scholars will always say that, that in terms of the pillars of gratitude, okay, the, the most important and key pillar of gratitude is al ma'rifah is acknowledgement and recognizing the fact that you have received the blessing. It's not just expressing it upon the tongue. How many of us express gratitude on the tongue and there is nothing in our hearts? We eat food and automatically we say, Alhamdulillah, you know? we, we praise, it's become a habit. And for many of us, we say it because if we don't say it, it just seems wrong. You know? But in, inside of your heart, there's nothing there, it's empty. There's no form of you know, love and uh, real appreciation of what Allah has given to you. It's not there, it doesn't exist. And that's what we really need, okay? But anyway, we're going to, I'm gonna come back to the pillars of, 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 of gratitude later. But so for Allah, how do we understand this in light of Allah? He recognizes our good actions. That's what we mean, and that's why the, in a good translation, the recognizer and the rewarder of good, the appreciative. He's the one who appreciates our 
good actions, which is the essence of shukr. Because we said the essence of shukr is not being grateful, it's not thanking. That's not the essence. The essence is what? Recognition of the good. So Allah, He recognizes our good deeds. And He appreciates them. And He appreciates them. Now, <clears throat> um, it's quite interesting that in the Arabic language we use the word shakur also to refer to an animal which, um, uh, which is very content with a little bit of food. Okay, if you, you know some animals are very greedy by nature. Okay, you give them food, they'll keep on eating, like pigs. Yeah, that's one of the key characteristics you have with pigs. You can give them food, they just keep on eating. Certain animals, okay, they'll, they, they, they will suffice with a certain amount of food. For example, cats. You know, certain animals, or birds, for example. You give them a certain amount of food, and they'll eat until they're, they're full, they have their, their amount, and then that's it. They, they'll just move on, they'll do what they need to do. So there's this idea of um, being content with a small amount. So even animals can be described as being shakur. Okay. Now, and that's why in a hadith, حَتَّى إِنَّ الدَّوَابْ لَتَشْكُرُ مِنْ لُحُومِهِ And even from animals, there are those that are grateful for, for what they have. Okay. And they appreciate what, what has been given to them. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when we apply it to Allah, we say, we describe it as being, He is the one who appreciates the small good actions that we do. The most smallest of good deeds, Allah will appreciate. He will appreciate it and He will love it and He will reward greatly for a small action that you do. For a small action. What's the, what are the most beloved deeds to Allah? The most beloved deeds to Allah are those that are, that are most consistent, even if they are small in amount. Okay, human beings, on the other hand, they just like to see lots of everything in large quantity before they become appreciative. But Allah, that's not the case. Now, just to give you an example, a manifestation of how Allah is shakur. Rasulullah said a very famous in one hadith before he said Bukhari. Okay, it's a hammal abdu bi hasan falam ya'malha katabaha Allah wa indahu hasanatan kamila. That if a servant intends to do a good deed, if a servant intends to do a good deed and he doesn't end up doing the action, Allah will write it down with him as one complete reward. <coughs> and if he ends up doing it, Allah will write it down as ten hasanat, up until seven hundred fold. This means, brothers and sisters, this means if you intend, just intend to do a good deed, Allah will reward you automatically just for the intention. Just for the intention. <coughs> And if you end up doing it, Allah will multiply it by 10 straight away. Straight away. Okay, up until 700 fold, depending on the quality of the deed. And the scholars, they say, now, the person who doesn't end up doing the action, is that because there's some sort of impediment there, or some sort of barrier? And by agreement of all scholars, if, for example, you intended to a good, for example, you, prefer, you, you intended to perform Qiyam al okay? You overslept. You didn't hear the alarm. Will Allah reward you for that qiyam? Yes. You'll be rewarded. What about if the alarm clock went off? Okay? And you switched it off and you said, I am just too tired, I can't pray. You, you are still rewarded for that initial intention that you had. You're still rewarded. And that's why the scholars will always say, say Make intentions for good deeds, even if you think you won't end up doing it. Because by Allah, the more intentions you make, the, the easier Allah will facilitate it for you at the end. Now imagine a person said to himself, Oh, I'm a very lazy person, so 
to perform Qiyam al-Layl is something which is really difficult. I'm never going to do it. Do you think this person will ever perform Qiyam al-Layl? Never. With an attitude like that, he will never. But if he said to himself every single night, I'm going, I, I intend to perform Qiyam al-Layl, and he does something practically to help him to do it, even though he thinks it's unlikely that he'll end up doing it, Allah will still reward him and he will bring him closer to that deed until he eventually performs it and he's consistent upon doing it. You take one step to Allah, Allah comes to you running. That's one of the meanings, the implications of Allah being a shakur. And this is a hadith, Rasulullah said this. That you take one step to Allah, Allah he will come to you running. Okay? So, and if you end up doing the action, Okay, Allah multiplies it by 10 straight away. But when it comes to sin, it's different. And this is beautiful. Rasul said, Man hamma bi sayyi'atin. That whoever intends to commit sin, falam ya'malha, but he doesn't uh, do it, Allah will give him a reward for that as well. But that's on the condition that he changed his mind. Okay? Not because there was some impediment there. If there was some barrier that, that prevented him from, for example, you want to go murder someone, you run into the kitchen, look for a knife, you don't find a knife. Okay? You're not going to get reward because you didn't kill him. In fact, you probably earn a sin in the hereafter because you intended to kill that person. There's no worldly consequence though. You won't be, you know, punished in the world because of because you didn't end up committing that sin. But if you end up changing your mind, then Allah will reward you. This shouldn't give you the license to start saying to yourself that <coughs> let me start intending to commit evil and then change my mind at the last minute and that way I can earn some reward. You shouldn't do that because the person who feels safe in doing so, it's, it's, he's playing with his deen. He's playing with his iman. Because who knows, after you make that intention to commit that evil, your heart's going to be attached to that sin and you won't be able to stop yourself in the future. So never put yourself in that position. Never ever. I mean, I remember there was a brother who, you know, he said to me that, um, I wish the Dajjal was here now. Alhamdulillah. Why did he say that? Because he said, if the Dajjal was here now, I'll force myself to fix myself up. Because he's not, he wasn't really a practicing brother. You know, but if the Dajjal was here, I'll be able to force, you know, I'll have to join the right camp. You know, I'll have to join the believers. I have no choice then. SubhanAllah. A believer never feels safe from his own self. What was one of the du'as Rasulullah used to make all the time? When I rode the min what min shuroori and fusina. I seek refuge in Allah from the evil of my own self. SubhanAllah. Okay? So um, uh, I mean just a beautiful hadith which I think really clarifies the way that Allah appreciates and accepts our deeds. Rasulullah says, Man tasaddaqa bi'adli tamratin min kasbin tayyib. That whoever gives charity just from a part of a date, part of a date, from a halal income, what I have Allah in tayyib, and Allah only accepts that which is good and wholesome and halal, what does Allah do? فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ يَتَقَبَّلُهَا بِيَمِينَ Allah accepts that act of charity with His right hand. ثُمَّ يُرَبِّيهَا لِصَاحِبِهَا حَتَّى يُرَبَّ حَتَّى كَمَا يُرَبِّ أَحَدُكُمْ فَلُوبُهَا That Allah will then nurture and grow that act of charity just like one of you grows your young horse you have and you nurture it. حَتَّى تَكُونَ مِثْلَ الْجَبَلِ Until that small pit or part of a day will turn into a mountain. Allah will grow, make it grow. And this authentic hadith which is reported in Bukhari and, uh, and, and, and Muslim. So that truly shows that Allah, He loves and He appreciates the actions that we do. Therefore, from the manifestations or from the effects of knowing that Allah is a shakur, is that the believer never belittles any deed. He never belittles even the most smallest of actions. And we are living in a time where uh, obviously the Ummah is suffering from a number of calamities and disasters and wars and conflicts. And so sometimes people, uh, you know, they, they lack insight. 
And so they rush into things thinking that this is what we need to be doing and we shouldn't be concerning ourselves with other things. You know, let's put aside fiqh and aqidah and these issues. We should be concerning ourselves with the affairs of the ummah only. And they fail to understand that it's when you learn your fiqh and your aqidah that you are actually correcting the affairs of the ummah. Umar ibn Khattab he wrote a letter to Sa'id ibn Abi Waqqas who was the leader of the Muslims of Iraq at that time and he said to him in this letter, well documented letter know that the only reason why we defeat them is because of their sins and it's not because of our weapons that we have so he said, because that's always been the case, the kuffar have been militarily more advanced than the believers it's still the case today. So we don't defeat them based on military prowess. It's because of their sins that we defeat them. So therefore he said, if we commit sins like they do, they will defeat us. So go and command your soldiers to clip their nails and to remove their underarm hair. SubhanAllah. Look at what he is attaching importance to in a battlefield. In a battlefield, he's attaching importance to these matters. And then we have people today saying these are minor affairs. People who have this understanding, they do not understand, you know, uh, they don't understand the nature of the religion. They don't understand the sunan of Allah, the universal laws of Allah, how he brings about change. How he brings about change. I mean, the other day I was watching on, 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 on YouTube and, you know, some young Muslims who Allah guide us and guide them all, you know, they were mocking their religion and they were saying, you know, looking at people who speak about fiqh, you know, and, 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 and these fiqh related issues, mocking them and they would say, shut the fiqh up, you know, shut the fiqh up, they would say, mocking it as if, you know, I mean, Audhu Billah, this resembles a type of swear, okay, that people say, and as if like, why are you concerning yourself with these things? These petty arguments, no, this is part of our deen. We don't distinguish between these you know, so-called minor issues and major issues. They're all major issues. As soon as we, we begin to belittle a part of the religion, and that is when we will fall into mistakes. And that's what also some said, لا تحقرن شيئا من المعروف Don't belittle anything of good. Don't belittle any form of goodness. Like we said, even when it comes to hastening to break your fast, don't be little that. Because the state of the woman is connected to that. لا تحقرن شيئا من المعروف ولو أن تلقى أخاك بوجه طلق Even if it means meeting your brother with a smiling face. With a smiling face. Don't even be little that. Because that is something which is really important. Rasulullah صلى الله said, اتقوا النار ورب شرك تمرتين That you know, protect yourself from the hellfire, even if it means it is a part of a part of a date, giving it in charity. And if you can't find even a part of a date to give in charity, then say a good word. Say a good word. But do not belittle good deeds. And that's really important. Um... <coughs> The, uh, another manifestation of uh, knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a shakur is that we should strive to recognize His blessings upon us as well. Just as Allah knows and appreciates our deeds, then it is more important that really, or you know, very important that we appreciate and understand Allah's blessings. And this is for a number of reasons. Firstly, because Allah says, أَكْثَرُ النَّاسِ لَا يَشْكُرُونَ Most of mankind do not give thanks. And when Allah speaks about shukr in the Qur'an, what is the opposite of shukr? Kufr. Allah makes a comparison between shukr and kufr. And kufr is to deny what Allah's blessings. And kufr is also disbelief. And also, we said it's important to recognize Allah's blessings. Why? Because it is a means by which uh, you are grateful to Allah. And we said, what's the basis of being grateful to Allah? Internal recognition. Firstly. Secondly, praising Allah upon the tongue. 
for that blessing after truly internally recognizing it and thirdly using that blessing in a way to please Allah through your ibadah to him. So if Allah bless you with wealth, give sadaqah, give zakat. If Allah bless you with knowledge, teach it to other people. If Allah gave you physical strength, use that to help the Muslims around the world, etc. So whatever blessing Allah has given you, you use that in a way to please Allah. And these are three major pillars that the scholars would consider to be the three pillars of shukr, the three pillars of servitude. Although Ibn Qayyim would add to that, that uh, another important pillar is that you become humbled and abased in front of the one who gave you those blessings. That's a manifestation of gratitude as well. And you know, this can be found in um, or acknowledging the, the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, His favors upon you. It, it's found within a beautiful dua Rasulullah used to make, which, is, which he called Sayyidul Istighfar. The master of all supplications when it comes to seeking Allah's forgiveness. And this is something that you should say on a daily basis, in the mornings and in the evenings. And whoever does that, he will be from the people of Jannah. And this is the dua Rasulullah said, Allahumma anta rabbi, O oh Allah, you are my Lord. La ilaha illa anta. There is no one worthy of worship except you. Khalaqtani wa ana abduk. You created me and I am your slave. Look how this all begins. What is this all? I'tiraf, recognition, acknowledgement. You are my Lord, I am your slave. You created me. All acknowledgement. Uh, and I am trying to follow your covenant and this pact that I have with you according to the best of my abilities. I seek refuge in you from the evil that I have committed. And I confer your favors upon me. And I, and I admit to my sins that I have committed against you. And so therefore forgive me, for indeed no one forgives sins except you. Rasulullah said, Man qala hadha, whoever says this in the mornings, in the morning, certain of it, certain of what he says, and then he dies on that day, he will be from the people of Jannah. He will be from the people. But you have to say it more with certainty. Okay, but the, the, all of that dua and dhikr. It focuses on the i'tiraf, recognizing Allah is your Lord, recognizing your sin, recognizing the favors of Allah upon you. And the danger is, is that when we don't recognize the favors of Allah upon us, these blessings will not will turn from a ni'mah into a ni'mah. They'll turn from a blessing into a source of punishment. Because on the day of judgment, if we don't recognize Allah gave us, has given us those blessings, then what will happen is Allah will say to us that you did not thank me for these blessings and therefore we will be in sin and we will be troubled by them. And that's why the scholars used to say Hold on to the blessings of Allah by being grateful to Him. That's how you maintain your blessings, by being grateful to Him. Otherwise it will slip out of your hands and there will be a source of punishment for you. So, I mean, there are many other reasons why it's important to be able to recognize um, Allah's uh, favors uh, upon us. But there's another important point before I conclude, so I really need to go, um, is that Rasulullah he said, Man lam nas, lam that the one who doesn't thank mankind, he does not thank Allah. Why is this the case? Think about this very carefully. If you are not a person who thanks people, when seeing the source of that blessing is very easy, when someone gives something to you, it's very easy to make that connection between that blessing and that person. Isn't it? When someone gives you money, for example, you can clearly see that person has given you money. So you'll be grateful. It's easy to be grateful to that person. But it's difficult to be grateful to Allah. Why? We can't see Allah in this dunya. We can't see Allah. We can't see Him, you know, giving us these things. In fact, what it seems apparent is that it's other people that are giving us these blessings. It's our own selves that are achieving these blessings. So therefore, if you can't be grateful to mankind, and without a shadow of a doubt, you will not be grateful to Allah. You will not be grateful to Allah. 
So that's why the believer he is continuously in a state of being thankful towards other people. Always he should be grateful, and this is what you know. In fact, one of the du'as Allah teaches us in the Quran: Allahumma, you know, Rabbana, awzi'na and ashkura ni'matak allati anamta alayhi. Oh Allah, give me the ability to be grateful for the blessing that you granted to me and be to be grateful to my parents. And that I do good deeds. So you have to ask for that, subhanAllah, that ability to, to, to be grateful. So, you know, we should train ourselves to be grateful to, to, to other people. Train ourselves to be grateful. And that will help us to be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And on that point, inshallah, we end by <coughs> recognizing the, the favors that Allah has bestowed upon us in these short amount of weeks by gathering us together and to give us the tawfiq to, to sit to speak about Him, His beautiful names and His qualities. And so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by all of His beautiful names and attributes that He grants us Jannah and that He grants us the ability to meet him, inshallah, on that day without any sins and that Allah is pleased with us and that we will be pleased with him, inshallah. I call the Qawli Hadha wa astaghfirullah wa alaikum. Subhanakallah wa alhamdulillah 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 wa alhamdul